You remember this story from a couple years ago, an EC-135 in Philadelphia where something happened mid-flight. The crew swear that the helicopter turned upside down. The pilot manages to crash land the helicopter into the side of a church. Jet fuel is spilling everywhere. One of the med crew rescues this tiny little baby while the other med crew rescues the pilot. What a crazy story and everybody lived. But these bizarre chain of events left us all with some burning questions. What was the loud bang that the medic heard? Did the helicopter really completely roll all the way over? Why was it making such a strange noise when caught on camera? Well, the final report is out and guess what? We still have unanswered questions. But even with those unanswered questions, we still have stumbled upon a pretty interesting chain of events that includes some very important lessons for anybody that's flying on a medical helicopter. How did all this occur? Stick around and find out on this episode of The Dr. Medic. Now to get caught up, you can click the link in the video description to watch the first video that I posted last year on this incident, but the quick and dirty of it is this. You have an EC-135 P2 Plus with two 700 horsepower Pratt & Whitney 206 B2 engines transporting an infant from Wellspan Chambersburg Hospital in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania on about a 55 minute flight to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This helicopter was operating under the local brand name of LifeNet out of Hagerstown, Maryland, with the official operations being completed by Air Methods. The pilot's name is Dan, and he was plenty experienced with over 4,100 total flight hours. The med crew was in the back of the aircraft managing patient care when one of them hears a loud bang, followed by a hard bank to the right, and then what he described as a fully inverted roll, which left himself and his flight nurse partner pinned against the ceiling of the aircraft with the infant momentarily floating off of the stretcher. The pilot then manages to gain some level of control and levels the aircraft off, but they are still losing altitude fast when the following is caught on a doorbell camera. Now take a good listen. <laughs> Right after the helicopter flies over this location, the helicopter crashes into the corner of this church. And after the crash, with jet fuel pouring out of the aircraft and a small fire by one of the engines, flight paramedic Kevin Chaffee hands the baby to flight nurse Christopher Lawson, who escapes, gets himself and the baby to safety, while Chaffee helps rescue pilot Dan while at the same time shutting down the engines. Everyone makes it out alive with the flight nurse Lawson accompanying the baby to a hospital in a ground ambulance with paramedic Chaffee riding into the hospital with pilot Dan, who did suffer severe injuries, including fractured ribs, a fractured sternum, and multiple fractured vertebrae. Now, following this crash, there were all kinds of speculation, including a possible bird strike, or maybe a broken pitch link, or maybe even some weird reason for a loss of tail rotor effectiveness. Now, all of these things, though, would have been easily found during the NTSB's investigation, but they found nothing. No evidence of a bird strike, nothing wrong with the pitch links or the hydraulic system or the computer system or any of the drivetrain for that matter. For all intents and purposes, they found absolutely nothing wrong with the function of this helicopter. But they did find some interesting things. So now that the investigation is completed, let's see if we can figure this one out. But before we do that, let's get some quick definitions out of the way. First is that this helicopter has full authority digital engine control, otherwise known as FADEC. FADEC is basically the computer system that controls all of the fuel flow in a helicopter such as the EC-135. When a helicopter has FADEC, there is no need for the pilot to really adjust anything at all related to fuel flow or throttle opening or anything like that. On an EC-135, the only real control that the pilot has over this would be when they first start the engine as the selector switch only has three positions off, idle, and flight. So in very basic terms, when the pilot starts the engine, they lift this switch from the off position to idle. Once the engine is within appropriate operating parameters, the pilot can then move the switch from the idle position to the flight position, which drastically increases the speed of the main rotors. 
The fuel flow and control for all of this is automatically done by the Thadex system. Same thing during flight. Whatever is necessary to keep the engines operating at the proper speed in order to maintain the rotor speed is all controlled by the Thadex system and the pilot does not have to worry about controlling fuel at all. Make sense? Now, this helicopter also had an integrated automatic flight control system, otherwise known as an AFCS, which is kind of an umbrella term that sort of lumps together things like SAS and autopilot systems. So what is an autopilot system? Well, while varying greatly in complexity and design, in short, an autopilot system is really any system that manages to control the overall stability of the helicopter. This can be controlled through different levels of stability, with really the first level being the Stability Augmentation System, otherwise simply known as SAS. Now, helicopter pilots do not just sit back while flying, and in fact, most helicopters would require that both the pilot's hands and both of their feet to be used at all times during all portions of the flight. This is because helicopters are inherently unstable during flight and the controls are super sensitive, requiring the pilot to constantly be making minor adjustments all along the way. So in pretty basic terms, SAS has the ability to stabilize the flight of a helicopter by counteracting certain pitch and roll disturbances due to outside forces such as wind or turbulence. Most SAS systems are two axis types augmenting just pitch and roll, but some could also augment a third axis with yaw. Now these SAS systems utilize sensors around the aircraft and also located on the cyclic and then during regular flight with the pilot's hand still on the cyclic, the SAS system controlled by little actuators can enhance the pilot controls by counteracting all those outside disturbances which normally would require the pilot to make all of those small adjustments. Now since the pilot no longer has to make all of those small adjustments, their workload is now drastically reduced and at the same time the flight is smoother. Now on this EC-135, in addition to the SAS, there were also several more advanced versions of autopilot as a part of the automatic flight control system with what are called upper modes such as altitude hold and heading hold or airspeed or vertical hold or even advanced modes such as navigation and approach. But regardless of which one of these modes I just mentioned, these are all modes that do more than simply maintain an attitude and can actually control and maintain the heading or altitude of the helicopter. And in any of these upper modes, they are all hands-off modes where the pilot would not need to keep their hands or feet on any of the controls if it was a four-axis system and would only have to maintain control of the collective if it was a three-axis system. So to wrap those definitions up, FADEC automatically controls controls the fuel so the pilot doesn't have to. The autopilot is part of the automatic flight control system and includes the SAS mode, which enhances the stability of the aircraft and reduces the pilot workload. The upper modes of the autopilot, like altitude and heading hold, are far more advanced and actually maintain the altitude and or heading of the aircraft and are designed to be flown hands off. Also, let's do a Cliff Notes version of what buttons actually power up and control the autopilot on this aircraft. Now take a look at this autopilot panel. Now we're not gonna go through this whole thing, but we will take a look at some of the major functions. On most flights, after startup is complete, the pilot would power up the autopilot by pressing this AP button on the top left. Once the autopilot system is on, the SAS is automatically enabled. Now remember, the SAS just augments several of the axes and does not actually control the flight of the helicopter and the SAS comes on automatically when the autopilot system is turned on. Now, many pilots could just fly the entire flight with everything left in this mode, but if they want to utilize more advanced technology where the computer system will actually control the flight of the helicopter, they would have to initiate one of those upper modes such as altitude hold or heading hold or even navigation or approach. But once those upper modes are enabled, SAS will temporarily be disabled as the SAS actuators and the upper mode actuators are actually a different set of actuators. So as an example, if the pilot wants to fly fly with altitude hold, they would have first turned on the AP at the beginning of the flight, which enables SAS. Then they would set their desired altitude, and when they hit the ALT button, the aircraft will essentially fly to that altitude and hold that altitude. If the pilot wants to disengage this mode, they would simply hit the ALT button again, which would disengage this upper mode and would then re-engage SAS because the entire autopilot system is still on. Now, please keep in mind, 
I'm not a pilot and I don't mean to be educating someone on how to actually fly this aircraft, but having a basic understanding of how these processes and functions actually work is extremely important to understanding what could have been the cause of this accident. So now that we have those definitions out of the way, let's try to find out what happened. Now, back in 2022, pilot Dan did make himself available for an interview with the NTSB investigators, but ended up revealing that he had no memory at all of the accident flight. But in September of 2023, in an interview with his employer, Air Methods, he stated that he was flying in cruise flight and had just descended from 5,000 feet to clear the first shelf of the airspace around Philadelphia. Then something happened. What happened? No one seems to know, and pilot Dan states that he has no recollection of the initial incident, but that he does remember being on the controls and fighting the aircraft in a dive. He noted that the collective was pulled all the way up, even though they were still descending. Now, as the aircraft continued to descend, pilot Dan seemed to be doing everything he could to level off the aircraft and search for a suitable place to land, but that he was over a heavily populated area and there were not a whole lot of choices. He said that he saw a patch of grass and tried to squeeze between some of the trees, and since he didn't have any collective left, that he simply pointed the aircraft towards his intended landing area and pulled aft on the cyclic during the landing. He ended the interview with, this all happened in 15 seconds or less. I saw the church wall at the last moment and thought I was going to die. Now, aside from this being caught on several cameras, there were also many witnesses, including one who specifically noted that the helicopter seemed to be rotating around its longitudinal axis as it was pointed down. And another witness, who just happened to be an EC-135 pilot, notes that everything seemed okay with the rotors, but that the noise was really bad. More on this noise, though, in a little bit. So without a solid recollection of events from the pilot, all we can really do is look at the data. Speaking of data, go to the website. Check it out, drmedic.com. First, was the pilot flying on autopilot? Well, remember, there are multiple modes of autopilot, including altitude and heading holds, as well as the SAS. As I mentioned before, in the EC-135, the SAS is normally enabled by default after startup, as the pilot would normally power up the autopilot just before takeoff, so we can assume that at least the SAS was on and functioning. The pilot was also in cruise flight when this incident first started, so it is perfectly understandable to assume that he had one of those upper modes of autopilot engaged, such as altitude hold or heading hold, or maybe even navigation. And post-crash data recovery shows that there were autopilot failure warnings that were recorded, so it certainly seems likely that at least something like heading hold or altitude hold, or maybe even both, were enabled. Now, remember that when these upper modes are engaged, that this will turn the SAS off for the time being, as they are two different sets of actuators. And then, when a pilot disconnects the autopilot upper modes, SAS would then be re-engaged unless a pilot specifically turns off SAS, which is normally very unlikely. Now, if the pilot did want to turn off SAS, they would probably already be flying with their hands on or close to the cyclic, and then they could hit this SAS AP cut button, which would completely disengage the entire automatic flight control slash autopilot system and give 100% control back to the pilot. But like I said, this would normally not be done during a routine flight like this, and certainly not in the middle of cruise flight. So remember, keep that in mind, the pilot would turn on the autopilot system right before they take off, which means SAS would be enabled unless the pilot either activates an upper mode by pressing an upper mode button or by killing the whole system altogether by hitting that SAS AP cut button. Now, this button is inset a bit to prevent unintended activation, which I think is an important part of this story. Now, why does this button even exist? Well, the button exists so that the pilot, while flying with hands on the cyclic, can make a decision to disengage the entire system so that they can take 100% control of the helicopter. But like I said, there are really not that many reasons to ever turn off the entire system unless they were in a few unique situations that required some very fine control of the cyclic, such as landing on a slope or something like that. So what happens when the autopilot or SAS are disengaged? Well, at a minimum, if the pilot does nothing, there will be a minor upset of the stability of the helicopter to some degree. If the pilot is flying hands off, which would mean the pilot is sort of you know, sitting there with their hands in their lap and their feet off the pedals in one of these upper modes and then simply disengages that particular upper mode, the SAS is still on and will immediately move to stabilize the helicopter while at the same time, the pilot would be going from hands off to hands off flying in a split second. So the pilot is flying along with autopilot on, hands off, 
and then chooses to disengage autopilot by pressing one of those upper mode buttons and then places his hands back on the controls, the aircraft will be unstable for a split second and then everything is fine. But if the pilot is flying along with autopilot on, hands off, and then not only is the autopilot disengaged, but the SAS is also disengaged, then the aircraft will become extremely upset and will require a much higher workload to recover as now there is no stability augmentation at all and the pilot needs to do a 100% of the work. And that is if the pilot disengaged the entire system on purpose. What if they disengaged the system by accident? Or what if the system randomly disengaged all by itself? Now, investigators did do some serious simulations following this accident to try and recreate the same scenario that pilot Dan found himself in. These scenarios included flying and cruise flight at around 120 knots with upper modes altitude hold and heading hold engaged. They then disengaged the upper modes and found that the helicopter was very easy to recover and maintain stability. But when they disconnected both the upper modes and the SAS by using the SAS AP cut button on the cyclic, the helicopter became unstabilized and required high pilot workload to regain control of the helicopter. So that's it. The pilot just accidentally hit the SAS AP cut button and that's what caused all of this. Well, no, not really, as there was really one more giant factor at play here, and that are those awesome Pratt & Whitney engines. Now, in a previous video I did on this University of Wisconsin crash, which was also in an EC-135, I dove pretty heavily into the specifics of overspeed protection of the EC-135 engines, so please go back and watch that video for an in-depth look. Also, the UW aircraft was a T model, which uses turbo mecha engines, while this crash was a P model, which obviously uses the Pratt & Whitney engines, so some of the numbers might be slightly different, but the process of overspeed protection is basically the same. So these turbine engines are generating a large amount of torque that is passed through an output shaft and attached to the transmission of the helicopter, which ultimately then turns the main rotors and tail rotor, or in this case, the Fenestron tail. The computer system and the FADEX system assume that the engine is connected to the transmission and will be under a load when at maximum turbine speed, which that speed should really always be somewhere around 100% during flight. The FADEX system is going to always adjust the fuel flow rate to keep the turbine speed at 100% and then the pilot controls the flight of the aircraft by changing the pitch of the main rotor blades and tail rotor using the cyclic collective and pedals, but for the most part the engine should always stay running at the same speed during flight. But sometimes there are problems and an output shaft might fail or any other number of items might fail, which could cause one of the output shafts from the engines to become disconnected from the transmission, which would all of a sudden mean that the torque on the engines could go from something like 80% all the way down to 0% in the blink of an eye. Think of it like this. Imagine riding a bike and you are pedaling really, really fast. Think about how much power you are using to push those pedals really, really fast. Now imagine that right in the middle of pedaling, the chain breaks, but you continue to pedal as hard as you can, but you're not really going anywhere. Your pedal rotation speed is gonna go much faster, right? But with zero torque going to your bicycle's back wheel. Well, you can tell that the chain is broken and just stop pedaling, but a turbine doesn't know that it's been disconnected and the turbine will then start to spin faster faster and faster, going way over 100%, which is not a good thing as there are mechanical limits to how fast that turbine can spin. And if the turbine engine spins too fast, it could literally grenade, which could then bring down an aircraft. So turbine engines have multiple levels of overspeed protection. The highest level will actually cause the blades to shed off the turbine to keep it from having a catastrophic explosion. The second level might just shut down the engine altogether by turning off all the fuel, but the first level first level will revert the fuel flow management from being controlled automatically by that FADEX system to now being required to be controlled by the pilot manually. But we know from this accident that there was no disconnection of the engine output shafts to the transmission and there were literally no mechanical failures at all. So the engines could not have oversped above 100% then, right? 
Well, let's go back to that bicycle example. Again, let's say that I'm pedaling really, really fast and moving on a flat surface. And let's say I'm pedaling as fast as my little legs can go, which would be 100%, which may make my bike go, I don't know, about 25 miles an hour or something. But then let's send my bike down a super steep hill to where gravity speeds my bike up to something like 40 miles per hour. Well, pretty soon my pedaling will not be able to keep up. The wheels will start spinning way faster than my legs can keep up with. So I could keep pedaling, but zero torque from my legs are being transferred to the back wheel because gravity is making the wheel spin faster than I can. The same thing can happen in a helicopter, especially if the helicopter is pointed down. And upon further investigation, it was found that there were exceedances in rotor speed and engine power turbine speed while engine torque was at 0% with the main rotor speed going from 100% to 112% and the engine turbine speed for both engines going to a peak of just under 127% at zero torque value. You see where this is going yet? So, Pilot Dan was flying along, most likely with upper modes engaged like altitude and heading hold with no problems at all. And then something happened. What happened? Well, no one really knows, but it is quite possible that somehow that SAS AP cut switch was activated, possibly by accident, or the entire automatic flight control system slash autopilot became completely disengaged somehow, which immediately upset the helicopter and sent it into a steep dive and rolling to the right and possibly into a full right roll. This dive drastically increased the main rotor speed, which just like me being unable to pedal hard enough downhill to actually put torque to the rear wheel of my bike meant that the main rotor was spinning so fast that the engine turbine speeds could not keep up to actually put any torque into the helicopter transmission. This caused both of the engines to overspeed to their designed threshold of 127%, which then initiated the overspeed protection by the FADEX system. But remember, this first level of overspeed protection by that FADEX system does not actually shut down the engine. Instead, the engines will continue to run at the last known fuel flow rate, which in this case was extremely low because they were in an easy cruise flight, which does not require nearly as much torque or fuel as is required during landing and takeoff. So what was Pilot Dan to do? Well, remember earlier I said that on the EC-135, the pilot does not have to control the fuel flow at all once into flight mode and that all of that fuel flow is controlled by the FADEX system? Well, as I said, if the engine senses a large overspeed increase, the FADEX system is designed to continue to run at the last known fuel flow rate, but this also places the engine control system into manual mode and the last known fuel flow rate will only continue until the pilot intervenes by manipulating the engine throttle twist grips for one or both of the engines. You see, even though the FADEC system controls the fuel flow rates normally, if there is some form of FADEC error, the pilot can twist the grips on the collective. In this case, on the EC-135, there are two twist grips together to increase or decrease fuel flow, which will increase or decrease engine turbine speed. On the EC-135, engine number one is on top and engine number two is on the bottom, and normally these would be left in the fly or neutral position, which is indicated by these two engines. Now, in this scenario where the FADEX system goes into manual mode, Airbus also states that Pilot Dan would have received multiple cockpit illuminations, including FADEX fail system 1, FADEX fail system 2, along with a master caution light. And upon inspection by the NTSB investigators following the crash, both of the twist grips were still found left in the fly or neutral position, and they had never been moved. Now, I know all of that was confusing, but here's the quick summary, okay? This crew was flying along without any issues. Some unknown force or movement or decision or possibly even some fluke anomaly upset the aircraft. So much so that the aircraft goes into a steep dive, which oversped the main rotor, which then disconnected all torque from both engines, which then caused both engines to go into overspeed protection, reverting the FADEX system to manual fuel flow mode. But 
Pilot Dan never manipulated those twist grips, and therefore the engines had little to no power. Even though Pilot Dan did an amazing job by being able to level off the aircraft, he had no power to the engines because the twist grips were never increased from the neutral position, and therefore Pilot Dan was forced to attempt to land this aircraft basically with no power at all. Now remember that crazy noise that was heard on the doorbell camera and by that EC-135 pilot on the ground? That sound sounds just like underpowered turbines struggling to stay running as they are not receiving the fuel flow that they need. In the end, the NTSB's probable cause was an in-flight attitude upset for undetermined reasons that resulted in a rotor system overspeed, a reduction of power from both engines, and a subsequent hard landing. And why do they call these crashes hard landings? That is such a poor description, and I think that that definition needs to be updated. Anyway, subject for another episode, I guess. So, as I said at the beginning, we have answered some questions, but we are still left with at least three big unanswered questions. One, what was that loud bang that the paramedic heard, as the pilot and the nurse did not recall hearing that bang? Two, what caused the initial upset of the helicopter? And three, why did pilot Dan not follow the FADEC fail procedure to include using the twist grips to increase engine power? I don't know the answers to any of those questions, but what I do know is that Pilot Dan is to be commended for getting this helicopter on the ground where all four occupants survived. And as I said in the first video, the flight nurse and the flight paramedic are just absolute heroes in my book as not only did they get through the initial crash alive, they got this infant to safety, helped get the pilot out, put out a fire, all while surrounded by flowing jet fuel, all while wearing these terrible Tyvek suits as they were managing patient care in the middle of a pandemic and doing it all with a cool and calm level of professionalism. Now, as wild as this entire story is, a similar event actually happened once before. This other incident occurred in Romania back in 2011 and was also in an EC-135 P2 Plus model. Now, according to the pilot of that incident, he was in cruise flight at an altitude of 3,000 feet and a speed of about 120 knots when the helicopter had a sudden and violent yaw to the right, followed by a nose down dive with a right roll. He recalled that he was flying with upper modes, altitude hold, and and heading hold both engaged before his in-flight upset. But he happened to be flying with his hands sort of hovering over the controls, not really controlling them, but kind of just keeping his hands on the controls just in case something happened as there were reports of heavy turbulence in the area. In this case, the pilot lost about 2,000 feet of altitude before regaining control of the helicopter. The engines in this Romanian incident also recorded overspeed events, but this time the engines oversped only to 116%, which would not have been enough to meet the 127% threshold required to kick the FADEX system into manual mode. The initiating cause for the in-flight upset, just as with the accident with Pilot Dan, could not be determined. Now, one last thing that we can learn from this accident is regarding the loss of situational awareness by Pilot Dan. The system generated a master caution warning and two FADEC fail system warnings, which Pilot Dan probably did not see, most likely because the incident occurred so suddenly and only lasted about 15 to 30 seconds. But this has actually been studied and researched before. I actually published a study a few years ago that measured situational awareness during high fidelity simulations with paramedic students. Now, the results of that study showed that most of the students lacked situational awareness and more importantly that they lost situational awareness due to being stressed and then getting tunnel vision which ultimately led to them ignoring major warning signs and making critical mistakes. Now that study was just with paramedic students and not pilots but situational awareness studies have been shown to have very similar results across all kinds of high dynamic environments where life and death critical decisions have to be made very quickly. But what has been shown to improve situational awareness in these types of situations? Well, 
more practice, more simulations, more training. Yes, EC-135 pilots do have to practice taking manual control of the fuel system with the twist grips, but without a full high fidelity simulator, this same situation cannot be fully recreated while up in flight or during a regular check ride. There is a training mode on the EC-135 that helps simulate this type of emergency, but it can only truly be recreated in a simulator. I know that there are EC-135 simulators that are used by these operators, which is a great investment and a great resource, but the industry could probably use more. Everyone in HEMS from the med crew to the pilots could use more simulation. But this is why the crews of things like space missions spend years practicing before they even take a single flight where they are constantly simulating these types of emergencies over and over and over again until it all becomes a part of their muscle memory. Now, do I think that the HEMS industry should practice like astronauts or that the industry has the money or the resources to even do so? No, I don't think that. But everything exists on a spectrum, right? On one end of the spectrum, you have every operator with their own approved training procedures that become FAA approved as a part of their recurrent training. And on the other end, you have astronaut training. All I'm saying is that the research supports moving the needle a bit in the other direction when it comes to simulations. Now, I do not know how often most EC-135 operators check off their pilots on dual FADEX system fails in their simulators, but this has now happened two times with the initial cause of both the incidents being completely unexplained. In other words, a new hole in the Swiss cheese model has been discovered, and I would highly recommend to any EC-135 operator, or any operator for that matter, to increase the frequency and or rigor of a dual FADEX system fail simulation during their approved training maneuvers. And one final note, Pilot Dan elected to fly this flight far above 1,000 feet. Had he had been cruising into Philadelphia at 399 feet when this incident occurred, he would have had no time at all to react and the aircraft very well may have impacted the ground long before he could have regained control of the helicopter. Altitude is your friend. I do thank you all for taking the time to listen to this story. Hopefully you learned something. And if you did, I hope I earned all those great things like a like and a subscription and even more. Feel free to head over to thedoctormedic.com for some really nerdy merch. Otherwise, stay safe, be nice to each other, and I'll see you on the next episode.